Maundy Thursday is when the bottom falls out. It's when this wild ride that Jesus and his friends have been on for the last three or so years finally comes grinding to a halt. When familiar faces scatter and all is lost in fear and confusion. Have you ever had the bottom fall out? Maybe it was when a loved one died. The world didn't seem the same place it had just a few days earlier. Or perhaps it was when you learned something new or came to some realization that shook your faith to its core. Your faith in God, or your faith in humanity, or even your faith in yourself. You were left not knowing which way was up, not knowing what to do next, or even how to pick yourself up for the next thing. Maybe it was a betrayal, a friend, a sibling, a parent, maybe even a spouse showed you a side of themselves that you had never known was there, and that after that moment you could never unknow. If you've ever had the bottom fall out, you know that something always dies. A belief, an idea, a hope, a relationship. But always a piece of yourself dies with it. Something dies and everything is forever changed. There is no going back to normal. There is only enduring until the new normal begins to settle out of the chaos. But in order to endure, there must be some hope that eventually the dust will in fact settle. This year during Lent, we've been exploring that promise, that covenant, by hearing the stories of Noah and Abraham and Moses and Jeremiah. Each of these characters experienced God's salvation in new ways, whether it was rescue from a flood, a new home and a new family, freedom from slavery and a promised homeland, the law of God written on hearts like stone tablets. And like those characters, every generation of Israelites experiences a new salvation, settlement, judges, monarchy, prophetic reform, exile, return. The story of scripture isn't about a singular salvation. It shows us a pattern of continual salvation, which promises that the pattern will continue on into our present and beyond, into our future. Each of these stories of salvation is part of the same story that we call covenant. God's continual work to settle the dust and cobble together something new that becomes not only normal, but somehow, sometimes, even better. This is covenant. Jesus is covenant. When Jesus sits down to dinner with his friends for the last time, he picks up the cup. And he says, This cup is my blood of the new covenant. Perhaps we can understand that to mean not a new covenant that supersedes the old, but the next experience of the same old covenant, a new way of hearing the old story. For his first disciples, this meant a new lease on old traditions, and eventually a departure from their Jewish heritage altogether, the only thing they'd ever known. In speaking those simple words, he was announcing the bottom falling out from under them, a new life that awaited them once the dust settled. What if those words mean the same for us? Perhaps Jesus was not a savior sent to perform a singular act for us, either of dying or rising. Perhaps he did not come as the son of God to overshadow us with his immense glory and power or to, as a model for us to follow in order to lead a godly life, or as a great physician to heal all of our hurts and cure all our ills, whether spiritual or physical. He is all these things, but they are not all that he is. In the prologue to his gospel, St. John tells us who Jesus is 
and what he has come to do. He writes, No one has ever seen God. It is God's only Son, who is close to the Father's heart, who makes God known. Perhaps he makes God known by dropping the bottom out on us, by upending everything else we've ever known until there's nothing else to know, only for us to wait until the dust first settles. We read these words of sacred scripture and we take them to be doctrine, to be a set of beliefs. We've instituted a ritual supper around this dinner scene. We've written pages and pages, tomes. We've spilled both ink and blood defending our particular notions about what this meal means. But what if Jesus didn't come to institute a religion? Not even the correct religion. What if instead he came to invite us into his own heart, just as he is in the Father's heart? We heard St. Paul's words this past Sunday, have the same mind in you that was in Christ Jesus. Well, this is the mind of Christ. When his hour had come, John writes, Jesus, knowing that he had come from God and that he was going to God, knowing that God had started the engine on this thing and handed him the keys, shows his love in this way. He stripped down to his shirt sleeves and washed his disciples' feet. Foot washing only happens two other times in the Bible. The first is when Abigail washes David's feet. At the time, she's begging for her life and for her husband's life, afraid that David and his band of uh, militia will kill them. Washing David's feet was her way of saying she could do whatever he wanted, take anything he wanted, so long as he let them live. It was an act of desperation and complete submission. The other time this happened is when Mary of Bethany anointed Jesus' feet with her expensive perfume and then wiped them dry with her hair. She did that as a show of complete and abject gratitude for raising her brother Lazarus back to life. In both cases, the women performing this task were debasing themselves to make the point of how utterly powerless they were. And then here is the Son of the Most High God doing the very same thing. You can understand why Peter objects. This is a complete reversal of the way things are done. Foot washing is far too intimate an act, far too scandalous. Not even a slave would ever be commanded to wash someone else's feet. It was just too degrading, even for a slave. But now it gets worse. Jesus says, I'm your master and your teacher, and I've done this for you. No servant is greater than the master, right? And so if I have done this, you should do this. Of course, he's not just talking about foot washing, is he? He's talking about this love that he has for them. This love that is to the end. And so the bottom falls out. But did you catch why? So that we may give love as great as the love that we have been given. Sometimes we get hung up on that word commandment. It sounds like an order given to a soldier or a slave. If we follow, we're being obedient, being good. But if we don't, or we're wrong, or disobedient, or bad. We tend to like commandments because we don't have to think that hard about it. All we have to do is follow, obey, imitate. But Jesus' whole point is that we can't know God by following, or obeying, or imitating. We can't know God through commandments, not his or anyone else's. And that's why our bottom falls out. There is no way for us to know God. 
This is the death of faith. But of course, we have to remember the story that we're in, don't we? In this story, we know death is the way to new life. The bottom falling out is the door opening to something new. As we aim for obedience or piety or holiness, and as we fail, or even sometimes as we attain these goals, we find them empty, wanting. Maybe we're really good at being religious. We're really good at being moral. But when we get there, we find there's nothing at all except our own empty pride, our own crushed expectations. And that, Jesus says, is exactly where we want to be. Because in each of these deaths, there is not only the oppor- there is the opportunity to trust Jesus. Not his teaching, not his death, not his resurrection, not his commandments, but him, the man himself, the one who washes our feet and lays down his life. In the scene that follows this immediately, Jesus tells his disciples that he is himself the way. To follow that way, the way of perfect love, is to be reborn, to experience salvation anew in every death, to continue along the journey of faith closer and closer to the Father, falling ever deeper and deeper into the heart and the mind of Christ, who is himself falling ever deeper into the heart and into the mind of God. This is what Jesus hopes for us that we may abide in him and he in us, just as he abides in the Father and the Father abides in him. Notice what Jesus tells his friends. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. There's no consequence for failure, no eternal punishment if you don't do them. No problem for those who cannot bring themselves to wash a foot or to love someone else to the end. But neither is there an opportunity to experience life in a new way, a way that Jesus calls abundant. In the moment of this meal, we begin to see that this story is about far more than just saving the church or the world or the universe. It's not just about life after death. These are all great things to hope for, but they are incidental to the equation, mere side effects of the fundamental goal of what Jesus is trying to get for us here. Ultimately, this is all about letting go of the idea that you and I and Jesus and the Father are all separate entities. It's about seeing that my story gives way to our story gives way to the story, the big picture of what God is doing for everything. We begin to see that we are one with Christ, and that in Christ we are one with each other and with God. This is why Christ loves those people to the end, because his love for them, his love for us, it is his love for God. God is one, the scripture tells us. God is one, and in God, all are one. Loving something, anything, everything with our whole being causes us to fall deeper and deeper into that interconnectedness, to see ourselves as a part of this greater reality. That's what abundant life is. That is life without beginning or end. Life that is, by definition, eternal. There is no destination for us to arrive at. Only a journey ever deeper from depth to depth as we find our place in the oneness of God. 
And so when the bottom falls out tonight, when Jesus is arrested and tried and unjustly executed, when his disciples are scattered and frightened, that's not a hitch in God's plans. It's a path to follow. To follow through the pain and the confusion, to endure and to know Christ deeper and better, and to abide in him as he abides in us until the dust settles and we regain our composure before the bottom falls out again. The bottom falls out and we find ourselves plummeting through doubt and despair and questioning. And if we're willing to keep falling, to keep following the way, we may just find ourselves in another salvation, a deeper salvation. Until the bottom falls out again, and we fall once again, deeper into God. <laughs>